For the War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to the wars engulfing the Middle East, a topic which has resurfaced as part of the 2016 presidential campaign. Speaking at a campaign event on Thursday, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump said Barack Obama and Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton created the Islamic State. Our government isn't giving us good protection. Our government has unleashed ISIS. I call President Obama and Hillary Clinton the founders of ISIS. They're the founders. In fact, I think we'll give Hillary Clinton the, you know, if you're on a sports team, most valuable player, MVP. You get the MVP award. ISIS will hand her the most valuable player award. Her only competition is Barack Obama, between the two of them. Well, on Thursday, conservative radio talk show host Hugh Hewitt asked Trump to clarify his comments. I got two more questions. Last night, you said the president was the founder of ISIS. I know what you meant. You meant that he created the vacuum. He lost the peace. No, I meant he's the founder of ISIS. I do. I, he's the most valuable player. I give him the most valuable player award. I give her, too, by the way. Him but he's not said, sympathetic to them. He hates them. He's trying to I kill them. It, he was the founder. Well, there you have Donald Trump answering Hugh Hewitt's questions. All of this comes as a report by the Syrian Center for Policy Research finds the death toll in Syria has reached nearly half a million people. In April, President Obama announced the deployment of 250 more special ops troops to Syria in a move that nearly doubles the official U.S. presence in Syria. Syria is only one of a number of ongoing conflicts in the Middle East. Last year, a record 60 million people around the world were forced to flee their homes, becoming refugees. Well, reporter Scott Scott Anderson examines all of this and much more in a remarkable new report published in this week's New York Times magazine. It's called Fractured Lands, How the Arab World Came Apart, examining what's happened in the region in the 13 years since the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003. It's told through the eyes of six people in Egypt, Libya, Syria, Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. The report also includes photographs by Paolo Pellegrin, a virtual reality video that allows the viewer to embed with Iraqi fighting forces during the battle to retake Fallujah. Scott Anderson is also the author of the book Lawrence in Arabia, War, Deceit, Imperial Folly and the Making of the Modern Middle East. Welcome to Democracy Thank Now! You. It's great to have you with us, Scott. Thank you. An entire issue yeah. of The New York <laughs> Times magazine. Um, First, respond to what Donald Trump is saying. And again, for his surrogates who are going around saying this is a metaphor, right. he's just as Hugh Hewitt says, what you really mean is that they created a vacuum for ISIS. He made it very clear. Right. He said, no, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are the founders of ISIS. Right. This is kind of an extrapolation of a, of a Republican talking point that's been out there for the last couple of years, which is that by by with, withdrawing American troops from Iraq um, in 2011, the Obama administration created the vacuum that allowed ISIS to step in. What, what's very conveniently forgotten in, the, in that in, in that whole issue is that, it was, in fact, it was the Bush administration that negotiated the, the withdrawal of American troops. In, in, the, in the spring and the summer of 2008, they negotiated with the Maliki regime to, to ha ha have American troops extend on, uh, to have a, a, a pretty substantial American military presence in, in, uh, in Iraq going forward. And what, what that, I, that foundered on was that the Maliki administration would not give American servicemen service uh, uh, members um, immunity from any crimes they might commit in the country. And on, the, on that basis, the, the Bush administration, not the, not the Obama administration, uh, announced they were, they were pulling all troops out of, uh, out of Iraq by 2011. So I think I, this, this, so this Trump idea is, I think, is a carry on from this talking point that's been kind of floating out there for the past couple of years. In fact, Donald Trump, in 2007, in an interview with Wolf Blitzer on CNN, when Blitzer said, what do you want to happen, because by then he had come out against the war in Iraq, right. in 2007, he said the U.S. should just get out right. now. Well, of course he did, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all. It, it, he seems to have been taking, you know, both sides of every issue on, uh, for a number of years, so. Well, I wanted to get to your uh, epic piece here, because I think the important to me is, uh, in this country, we, we suffer so much from historical amnesia. You attempted in a, in a newspaper magazine piece to go into the history before the United States even began to get involved in the Middle East, to lay the basis for some of the problems, especially in the most failed states now, back to 
European and and uh, colonialism in the region after right. World War One. That's right. If you if you if you look at the say the, 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 there's 22 nations in the, in the Arab world, and if you look at the three that have really been uh, sort of torn apart, it, it, it fragmented by the by the you know, so-called Arab Spring, it's Syria, Iraq, and Libya, and it's not coincidence that those are also three of the very small group of countries that were kind of created from whole cloth by the, the, the Western colonial powers at the end of World War I. Um, and I in each of those countries, what you have is um, a very weak sense of national identity. Um, and this is from the remnants of the Ottoman Empire? From the Ottoman Empire. They're all part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so there's this very, this very fragile sense of national identity. Um, and in all three of those cases, you, you had these very brutal totalitarian, totalitarian dictators come in. And, kind, and uh, among the other things they did, they were trying to forge this sense of national identity. And when, the, when you know, in the Arab Spring, when, when Saddam Hussein, when Mark Gaddafi were overthrown, Bashar al-Assad is on very teetering. What people's primary loyalty goes to is not to the state often, uh, but to the to their tribe, to their clan, to their to their sectarian affiliation. Explain though for people who don't understand how countries get created, right. especially younger people now. Right. Um, what you lay out so well in this piece, how these countries were carved up. Right. Under the uh, under the Ottoman Empire, the, the Ottomans it, it was a, a rather ingenious empire because it, the the very weakness of of the Ottomans was they turned into their strength, which was a, it was a very decentralized, very very weak central authority uh, empire. They gave their different provinces and different regions tremendous autonomy. To, as long as you paid your taxes and met your your military conscription rates, you were kind of free to run yourself, uh, uh, you know, as you saw fit. Uh, very little authority came down from. Constantinople. Um, when the when the Ottomans joined Germany in World War One, they lost. They're on the on the losing side, and you know the the, the winners from World War One, especially Great Britain and France, they saw the Ottoman Empire. As, they called it the Great Loot. That this this was the, the spoils of war that they could divide up. So they, they came into the Middle East and they and they formed these these artificial states. Iraq was Iraq is essentially a, a, a joining together of three. Autonomous Ottoman provinces, um, a Shia component, a Sunni component, and a, 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 Kurdish, a Kurdish component in the north. Syria is it's kind of just the opposite. Greater Syria encompasses an enormous area of, of that today would be Lebanon, Syria, Israel, uh, Jordan. So with the, this kind of greater Syria region, they, they divided it up into sort of ma more manageable parcels. In the case of Libya, you had you had three provinces under the Ottomans that were, that were very distinct. Um, in that case, it was the Italians who came in and joined them together and, and created this this uh, this colony of Libya. So then, in the Arab Spring, you have convulsions across the Middle East, but you note that those nations that had more historical uh, development, uh, like Egypt, uh, managed to somehow survive intact without this kind of civil war, but the ones that were created artificially out of the European colonialism are the ones that have suffered the most. That's right. I mean, it's, I mean it really is a, it's, it's, there's a commonality to, to the countries that have really fractured apart. Egypt, Egypt's a sad case in, in, in its own right. <laughs> For, for different reasons. But I don't think there's ever been a realistic fear in Egypt that it's going to somehow fracture apart, uh, b because there is, an, there is certainly in, in Egypt, there's a sense of nationalist identity going back uh, a thousand, two thousand years. So <clears throat> you have these six figures who you use to sort of illustrate, take us through the crises in these countries. And in Egypt, talk about the young women that you profile. Uh, uh, in Egypt, uh, uh, Leila Swaif, uh, she's she's the matriarch of this this political dissident family. That she has been active in 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 uh, <coughs> resistance against the dictatorship going back to the 19, 1970s. She was she was active against um, Anwar Sadat, uh, then in, under uh, Hosni, Hosni Mubarak. She and her and her husband, who is now deceased. Um, she was when the Tahrir Square demonstration started in, in January of 2011. She was in the forefront of it. Um, uh, 
She has three children who all also uh, all became activists. Who we've uh, talked to frequently. Her son having oh, you, been yes, in person and her daughters. Right. And now, she, now two, two of the three chi uh, children are, are in prison for extended periods. Um, the interesting thing about Leila Swaif is that very early on. Uh, even before Mubarak was overthrown, and it was about a 12-day revolution, um, she saw the danger signs of of the revolution being subverted. Um, she was she was lobbying for the the, the kind of political leadership, the, the anti-Mubarak political leadership in the country, to essentially seize power. She was she was basically telling them, do not let the military kind of step in into this, um, and she was not listened to. And Really, the, the, what's happened in, in Egypt over the last four or five years is, is, is very much a disaster foretold. We have to break, and then we're going to come back to this discussion. We're talking to Scott Anderson, who's a contributing writer for The New York Times magazine. This week, he contributed quite a lot. His article is the entire issue, without uh, any advertisements um, of the magazine. It's called Fractured Lands, How the Arab World Came Apart. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute.